morning. How's it going? Good morning. Good morning. I still need that. Is this working? All right, cool. So I thought I'd get up and first time preaching, so I thought I'd tell you a little about myself. I'm from Lexington, South Carolina, and I can be a tired overconfident. I like fried chicken. And if, for anybody who kind of knows me a little bit, I'm a bit of a dork. And I tell you, yeah, I'm a bit of a dork. Can you tell me why? Because I liked scootering before it was po- kind of popular. I was a big into scooter fan. I had my own little setup. And I got a little video to show you how awesome scootering is. I stand alone and I can't compare when I feel at home And time and time and time again I'm a rewind of the deep find the wind New way my face is placed perfect All in all it's all been worth it I prefer not to sleep in When the sun wants to keep in Yeah that's when my heart is beating Every, every time I love can't do any of that. I could never do any of that. That was never a part of what I could do, but that's what I wanted to be able to do. But anyway, it's kind of cool because to get, uh, to get to be able to do tricks and stuff like that, it takes some work. I tell you, I, I have my scooter and to be able to ride it, it, it was, took forever to get down. It took me like a couple days, but I finally got it down, so I was pretty good at it. And then trying to jump, you fall a lot. I saw the... Um, what's it called, the behind the scenes of them. You see how they did everything perfectly every, almost every single time? No. All those stunts were like three or four times in a row before they got it smooth all the way through. Because you fall a lot, but to, make, to get stuff like that and to be able to do awesome stunts where you're flying in the air, flipping it around, doing all that, it takes some work. It takes some time. It takes practice. It takes a lot of blood, a lot of sweat, and a lot of tears. 
And that's a lot, that's a big mentality that we have all growing up is, I remember growing up, if you want something, you've got to work for it, you've got to earn it, you've got to go for it. It's not going to be handed to you. And so you have to go after it. Like when I was doing scooters, I built a, a rail out of PVC pipe and a log, and I would draw it and I would write it, but it took a while for me to get it down. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 19 and in chapter 20. So if anyone wants to turn there, it's Matthew 19. We're going to start in 16. And, uh, yeah, we're going to take a look at a, a pretty interesting situation. To give you a little background of what's going on, Jesus is coming, is on his way to Jerusalem. And as they're traveling along, a really rich guy comes up and has a question for Jesus. In that verse, verse 16, I'm going to read not the whole thing, not 16 through 30, but about half of it. It says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to, to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what, good, what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one, one who is good. If you want to enter, enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these things I've kept since I was since I was a young man, or all these things I've kept, the young man said. What what do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Okay, I'm going to stop right there at uh, 22. But so the story is Jesus is, walking on, is going on his way to Jerusalem, and a really, really rich guy comes up, and he comes up to talk to him. Now, take a look, take a think about the, the way this guy is here. He's very wealthy. He's a, what, was, what did the Bible say, a young ruler came in. So this guy, he, he didn't just come walking up. He's coming in with his entourage. He's got his limo camel, you know. It's got like 17, 18 humps on it. And he comes in, he's coming in to talk to Jesus, and he has a question for Jesus. He has a question for him. He has a serious question. You don't become a rich, young ruler by being unintelligent. He's very smart. He has a very serious question for Jesus. He wants to know something. And what is he wants to know is how to have eternal life. He's asking a big question. He's asking, where's the fountain of youth? He's like, how do I have eternal life? Remember, this guy grows, grows up in a, in a um, Jewish background. He grows up learning the, learning the Torah. He grows up learning the Old Testament. And he wants to know how to have eternal life. And Jesus kind of gives him an odd answer. Because you've got to know, this guy knows the answer Jesus is about to give him. He says, you have to follow the commandments. And the guy says, okay, which ones? And he gives them a list of ones to follow. And he says, well, I've been keeping, I've kept all these. He says, well, what am I missing? The guy knows he's missing something. He says, what am I missing? And Jesus tells him, you've got to sell everything you have and come follow me. Okay? Oh, yeah, that's the next one. I forgot where I was at. But uh, he says, you have to sell everything you have and come follow me. And the guy walks away sad because he had great wealth. And actually, if you go continue down on the story, Jesus then looks at his disciples and he says, it's going to be easier, easier for one of these to go through one of the, the eye of one of these than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. Now, that's kind of strange. That's kind of strange. Because if you think about what the guy said, he's been keeping those commandments. The ones Jesus, Jesus said, he's been keeping them ever since he was young. Not a lot of people can say that. But he's been keeping them ever since he was young. He's rich. He's, going, he, he, he's, got what, he's got what it takes, according to the Old Testament. He's got what it takes to make it to the kingdom of God, but he's still missing something. But what is it? Well, you see, uh, when we were in um, Lubbock, Texas, and I was in uh, Sunset for about nine months before we went off to our mission fields, uh, one of the teachers explained it to me kind of cool. I always liked the example he gave, he gives, he gave us. But you see those? Those are Greek pillars. And the way a Greek pillar is made is you get a big stone, and then you get another big stone, same shape, same size, and you place it on top. And you continue to place things on top of one another, and you form a pillar. It's kind of interesting. He's to describe the pillar as your life. And the stones falling, fall as important. What's the most important thing to you, the thing that you love the most, the thing that is the most important thing is at the top of your pillar. 
And then other things fall in succession, like friends, family, yourself, how important you are to it, money. Everything else falls in importance. And the thing at the bottom of your pillar is the least most important thing to you in your life. So people's pillars in real life are really, really tall. Because we have a lot of things that are important to us. But on top of this guy's pillar, he had a problem. Because Jesus was telling him, you've got to put God on top. God's got to be the most important thing in your life. But what was on top of this guy's pillar was money. He had the most important thing this man was money. That was it. That was what he was after. That was seeking. God was in there. God was important to him because he was very he was very devout. If he was going to hang on to this, but it wasn't as important. It wasn't as important to him as money was. Money was still on top for him. And Jesus tells him, "You've got to get rid of all that. You've got to get rid of the money. You need to get rid of that, and you need to put me on front, and you need to come follow me." And he walked away sad because he wasn't willing to get rid of the money. Uh, we were doing, in Bible class, we were talking uh, around this subject, and we went into, and we um, showed that you can't serve two masters. You either live in the kingdom of God, or you live in the kingdom of me, or you live in the kingdom of money. Whatever it is, whatever is on top of your tower, whatever is the most important thing to you, whatever the thing you love the most, that's what kingdom you're living in. You're living in the world, you're living in the kingdom of God. Um... Jesus turns and he tells the disciples that this guy is probably not going to make it to the kingdom of heaven. And his disciples freak out. Okay? You read through the story, they kind of freak out a little bit. They're like, what? Now, a lot of times with the disciples, we go, okay, you guys were with Jesus. You guys heard everything. Why are you guys freaking out? Why were you freaking out in the boat? Jesus was there. And we kind of talk down on the disciples a lot. But you have to look at things from their point of view. Okay? You got to kind of look at things from their point of view. Uh... There's a couple things of variables here. Number one, Jesus hadn't died yet. They were still living under the Old Testament, okay? And according to the Old Testament, the man who just came to him was the cream of the crop. This guy had been following the commandments ever since he was a young boy. I mean, he was like, if you were asking um, people in that community who's most likely to make it up into God's kingdom, they'd probably point at this guy because he had been following everything, going for it. And so... They actually say in verse, um, verse 25, the disciples heard this, and they were greatly astonished and asked, who can be saved? They're saying, if this guy can't make it, then who on earth is going to be able to make it to heaven? Because this guy's the best we got. He's one of the best we got. How are, how, how's anybody else going to make it? And so Jesus gives them a really cool answer, and I, I think it's really cool. The answer he gives us is, Jesus, in verse 26, it says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. He said, you're right. It, you guys can't do it. Period. Straight up. You guys cannot make it. Period. But with God, all things are possible. He's telling them, but there's going to be a way. So we're going to keep going down through um, the story. Uh, in verse 27, Peter answered him, we have, left every, we have left everything to follow you. Then or we have left everything to follow you. What then will be there for us? Now, a lot of time Peter gets a bad rep for, you know, kind of denying Jesus and all the other dumb mistakes he made. But this guy's really smart. He got it. He says, we left everything to follow you. We got rid of all the stuff that was hindering, that, that, that was more important to us than you. And we got rid of it. And we put you on top, and we're following you for everything. So what is it that we're going to get for that? He understood the, me the message, one of the messages Jesus was trying to get to in this story. And then so Jesus says to him, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you, have, uh, you who have followed me will sit also on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left house, brother, sister, father, mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many of those who are first will be last, and many of those who are last will be first. So Jesus, he tells them, for following me and being my disciples and, tr and trusting in me and putting God first and living in the kingdom of God, you're going to get, you're going to get, Authority. You're going to get friendship. You're going to get, uh, and you're going to have eternal life. Now, we're going to hit eternal. Talk about eternal life for a second. There's a difference 
in the Bible between, you'll see two, two things, eternal life, and you'll see everlasting life. There's a difference between the two. We're, we're all going to live forever. We're all spirit. Spirit doesn't die. That's everlasting life. Everlasting, which means lasting forever, life. Very simple. You get, we're all going to last forever. But eternal life is different. That's life with God. So these guys aren't asking for the fountain of youth, okay? They're not asking for how do I live forever. They're asking how do I live with God forever. That's the point of what they're talking about. That's what they're focusing on. They're not just saying I want to live forever. They're saying I want to live with God forever. How do I accomplish this? And Jesus is saying you're following me. You're living in God's kingdom. You're going to live with us. You're going to live with me and God forever. And, but he does throw a kind of a curveball in there. He kind of throws a little bit of a curveball there. He throws a warning. He throws a big warning. He says, hold up for a second. In the last verse, he says, in verse 30, he says, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Well, I don't know about you, but that one tiny verse had me perplexed for years. I could not understand it to save my life. When I was younger, that's some very southern food that I got hungry of when I was looking through it. But, uh, but um, as I, when I was a lot younger and I was trying to understand this verse and what he said, by the first should be last and the last will be first, I thought about it, I thought about it, I thought about it. I wrote it down. I read a hundred different articles. I read a hundred different um, whatever it's called that you read. And I finally came to a conclusion to do an experiment. That night at supper... I stood in the back of the line to get food. But it was weird because my brother still ate food first. It didn't work. I didn't know what was going on with it. I tried it with car too. I would get in the car last and, and then I, I was still the last one to sit down. It didn't make any sense in my mind because I was looking at it the wrong way. I was looking at it the wrong way, big time. But the verse is talking about attitude. The verse is really talking about attitude in how and where in importance you are. We go through verse 21 through 16, uh, or verse 20, chapter 21 through 16. Jesus explains it with a parable, and this is the parable of, that we're going to be hitting today. I guess is the main part of the sermon here. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. I'm going to read 1 through 5. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for... The day he sent them, for the day he sent them into the vineyard. About the ninth, nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing there in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And he goes out, and he does that four more times. And he goes out, and he, he hits them at different times of the day. And the last time he goes out, the, the guy's in, it's about five o'clock, quitting time six. So they only end up working for about an hour. Okay, and then um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down to verse 11. When they, receive, when, uh, when they received it, they, okay, my bad, 10. So when, when those who came, or, so when those came, those who came were hired, first they expected to receive more. Okay, let's go back it up. I got a little, sorry, I got a little back, mixed up. Verse 9, the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a a denarius. A denarius is what they agreed to pay the guy who worked for the entire day. Okay, so they got a full day's wage for only working about an hour. So when when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have been borne the burden of work for the, in the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friends. Did you not agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give, you, I want to give the one who, who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or, you have, or are you envious because I am generous? So the first should be last and the last should be first. Okay, let's take a look at the, the setting, what's going on with the story here. So you got a landowner, guy, he's got a lot, he's got a lot of land. He has a lot of stuff that needs to be, to be brought in. It was a great vineyard. And uh, 
he goes, so he goes over to the marketplace, and he finds some people who, who are just sitting around waiting for a job. He says, hey, he calls them. He says, hey, you want a job? And they say, okay. And they agree to pay him a denarius, which was about a day's wage back then. And so they go out, and they start working. And he goes up again a couple, out, three, couple hours later, and he says, hey, he's found some more guys walking around, sitting around. He says, hey, you want to work? And they say, yeah. He calls them. They go. And does that again and again and again. And about, I think it was about the fourth time he goes out, he goes up and says, hey, how come you guys aren't working? And they say, well, no one's hired us. And he says, you want to work for me? Sure. But the interesting thing is, thing is he doesn't promise them a day's wage for the small amount of work they're doing. He, prom- he says, I'll pay you what's fair. So as the day goes on, what's fair is less and less money. But he ends up paying the guys a full denarius anyway. Cause he, cause, because he ended up paying them a full denarius anyway. It's kind of interesting. The story doesn't really make sense. That's not very good business. I don't know about any of you who's been in business, but if you pay somebody for an hour, the same you pay somebody for an entire day, you're not, you're not doing so great business-wise. But to the landowner, it wasn't about the work. The work wasn't what he was focused on. That wasn't the part he was focused on. He was looking at, ready for it, the attitudes. He was looking at their attitudes because he goes out late, just about, it's almost time to end. And he goes out again, he looks and he finds some guys who are sitting around. He's like, hey, how come you aren't working? He says, well, no one's hired us. And he calls them to come work. And they come and do it. Even though they're, they're not expecting to get a lot, they still come and do it. They have a good attitude. They have an attitude to work. They want to go out and they want to go do it. And because of their, their attitudes, he gives them a full day's wage, even though they, they haven't earned it. He still gives them a full day's wage because he doesn't, he's not interested in the work that's being done. He's interested in the attitude that they're doing it. And then at the end, you have two guys, one of them who's worked all day, and one of them's only worked an hour. And the guy who's worked all day, he's like, well, why is this guy getting the same pay I am? And the landowner says, stop being envious. Knock it off. You have some stuff you need to work on. You're a good worker, but knock it off. I can, because it's what, because who, uh, who after all, owns the money, the landowner, and he can give it to whoever he wants, however he wants. So the question is, how can we apply this in our lives? What is, P- what is Jesus trying to get across to Peter? What's the point of the story here? Well, there's several different points to the story. But one of the points is that um, it's had a complete train wreck of thought. Hang on, give me one second. Complete train wreck. I'm on a different country. <laughs> All right, one of the points of the story is, is Peter tells him, okay, so I've, got, I've gotten here. We got here. We're the, we're the 12 disciples. We're the first ones who are following you. What do we get? And Peter's trying, or Peter, Jesus is trying to get across to him that it does, it's not, doesn't matter the time of service. It doesn't matter when you get into it. Because Jesus calls us at different times. God calls us at different times. The point is the attitude and the willingness to work and the willingness to enter the kingdom. The rich young ruler got called that day. He got straight up called by Jesus face to face to come follow him and come be a part of the kingdom. He says, if you want to be perfect, you need to sell everything and you need to come follow me. But he had the problem. He, money was more important to him than God. And that's everybody, before we're called, we have stuff that's more important to us than God. Right before we're called, everybody does. And it takes a very, it takes an amount of humility to put that away and put God on top. The majority of the world, I guarantee you, is themselves. It's me. Everybody, a lot of people live in the kingdom of me. And to put me down and to put God on top is a very hard decision. And that's one the rich young ruler couldn't make. Now, it, now, I'm sure when the landowner went out and talked to people, and he, he went out and said, hey, you guys want to work? I'm sure he found some that were like, no, I'm good. I want to stay here. I want to live here. But the ones who came were the ones who accepted and the ones who humbled themselves enough to work with the landowner. And, P, and Jesus is trying, to get across, is trying to get across to Peter and us that the amount of time is not the point. The point is not the amount of time you work. The point is not how much hay you bail. That's not the point. In, um, I hope that's the next slide. Yes, it is. In Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2. 
verses 8 through 10, I keep hearing myself over and over, it says, he says it really good. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not from your doing. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We're not, the denarius in the story represents eternal life. I don't know about you, but that is a huge gift. And there's no way on earth that we can work our way and earn it. That's what he's trying to tell Peter. You can't earn eternal life. It's a gift from God. And a lot of times, I think, we were like, well, I've been a Christian for 300 and odd some years. I showed up to church every single time. I, I, I've been on 300 mission, mission teams. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Why don't, why don't I have this? Why don't I have this? Because God doesn't look at what it is we've done. That's not the point to him. We get the, just by accepting it, by becoming part of the kingdom, we're in there for the reward. Because God gives it, that's how he is, that's he's generous, he gives it freely. He's not looking for what we do because there is no way. You could be a Christian for 5,000 years and you could spend every single moment devoted to God and you still will not earn eternal life. You will still not be able to fix what was broken with the relationship with God. We can't earn it. And Jesus knows. That's why Jesus died. We don't earn our salvation. Jesus earned the salvation for us. And it's, a, and it's a gift. And God gives us the choice with that. But it's coming. <laughs> Probably need to hit this and I'll remember. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. But again, it's about the attitude. It's about the heart. Of the one who serves Paul. That's Paul up there. You didn't know he looked like that, but he does. It's an old picture, I'm telling you. But Paul was one of the hardest workers for God. This guy, he was super zealous for God before he got into Christ, and after Christ, he was even more. I mean, this guy was did so much. He planted tons of churches. He was out there. He was constantly fighting for for God, and the end of his life, he goes to jail. This guy had more reason than next to, he goes to jail. Yeah. But this guy had more reason than next to anybody to say, God, hey, you see all I've been doing for you? Why am I in this situation? Put someone else here who hasn't done that much, you know? I kind of deserve to be up here. I kind of deserve to have a nice life. You didn't realize he had more right to say that than anybody. But he didn't. In fact, later in his life, he said, he said I count myself as the least of all count myself as the least. I am definitely unworthy of all this. He did all that, but he knew God wasn't looking for what he did. You're not gonna, he, he knew he wasn't going to impress God by planning a church. He knew he, that wasn't going to be the thing that impressed God because he knew that God looks at our heart. Amen. He knew that God, that's what God looked for. And he, he was following a pattern. Paul, I guarantee you, Paul was not looking at this guy saying, ooh, I need to be like that. Or he was looking at this and saying, ooh, I need to be a but. Paul was following a pattern. Paul was following Jesus. He had his eyes on Jesus. The rich young ruler, Jesus said, hey, you need to come follow me. He's saying, you need to watch me learn how I do it because Jesus came down here to be, not only to be our Savior, but to be our example. Amen. He's our example from God. He's the only guy ever in history to make it through an entire life without ever having trust problems with God. He trusted God completely. When we sin, whenever, whenever we tell a little white lie, we're telling God, you don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Lying is okay, actually, by the way, just in case you didn't know. Jesus never said that. Jesus trusted God completely throughout his entire life. And Paul saw that, and Paul was doing his best to follow his example. That's what's so cool about, um, that's what's so cool about Jesus. In fact, I think it was Paul... Had a, Paul wrote Philippians, right? Yeah, okay, that's right. I just want to double check. But he even says, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, it's one of my favorite passages. He says, you're in uh, verse 5 on down. I'm probably going to read through 8. He says, in your, it says uh, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, 
who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God uh, something to be grasped, rather made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness and found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, I want you to imagine this with me for a second, all right? I want you to imagine this with me for a second. How cool would it be to be sitting here, sitting in nothing? Imagine, all right, all right try this. I want everybody to imagine nothing. For guys, it's going to be a little easier. But imagine nothing, okay? Imagine absolutely nothing. And that guy walks, somebody walks in, into that nothing, and he looks around, and he's like, let there be light. And stars jump into existence. They didn't exist. They're not there. And they jump into existence because they're terrified not to obey the command of the man who just walked into that nothing. That's how powerful Jesus is. In Colossians it says, the heavens and the earth were created through him. Jesus is God. And yet, and yet, the Bible says, just right there we read, he humbled himself. I, I've, you read through history, like with Alexander the Great, and as soon as humans get a certain amount of power, all of a sudden, they're not humans anymore. They consider themselves gods. As soon as they get a certain amount, Alexander didn't consider himself human. He was a son of, uh, what was it, Achilles? Not Achilles. He was one of the gods I can't remember the name of. He was that son of it, and he went to the temple, and he grabbed the shield, and he went into battle with that god shield because he was a god. He was not a human. He was delusional. Jesus was God. Jesus was God. And yet, he came down because he loves us. You read John 3, God so loved the world. That's why he came. And he was willing to humble himself and to put himself less than everybody, to think of everybody before him. That's why Paul's sitting in the prison thinking, man, I want to be with you, God. I love you so much. Why am I with God? And then he tells everybody, but I'm going to stay because I'm thinking of you guys, and I know you guys need me down here. That's why Paul was able to do it, because he was focusing on Jesus. Jesus came to be our example. Jesus came. He put everybody's needs above his own because he loves us. That's the example that we need to be following. That's why Jesus says the first should be last, and the last should be first. That's what the parable is talking about. Somebody who considers themselves last, who's humble, who's humble and considers themselves last, is going to be first in the kingdom of God. And anybody who considers themselves greater than other people will be last, because that was the example Jesus set. You have to back down to the parable with the two guys, you know. You got one guy who's like, this guy doesn't deserve what I get because I worked longer than him, because I said did better than him, because this guy just doesn't deserve it because I'm better than him, period. That's it. And the guy Andover looks at him and says, you are envious. You need to work on it. Which is, He's in the kingdom. He's working in the field. But he has problems. We mess up. That's why Jesus died. So that's so we can keep working for it. And he, the landowner says, you need to work on this problem you have. And the problem he had was in his tower of importance in his life, he was above this other guy. He was above this other guy. God was still on top, but he was still above this other guy. He wasn't matched up with the... With the, with the the pattern Jesus set for us in his life. Oh, yeah. I thought it was kind of cool. I totally forgot about that, but I think it's kind of cool. I'm going to say it anyway. But in Hebrews 2.11, that same guy who creates everything just by saying it is still humble enough to call us his brothers and sisters. I thought that's kind of interesting. But anyway. Oh, okay. That's the end of it. <laughs> But anyway, what I want to close with today is, I can't remember a PowerPoint to save my life, so we're gonna, I'm just going off the top of my head. But what I want to close with today is, think about your life. What's on top of your, your tower? What's the most important thing to you? What is it you love the most? What kingdom are you living in? Is it the kingdom of God, or is it the kingdom of something else? And where in importance do you fall? Are you more important than other people? Are you less important than other? 
other people? And does your life match the example Jesus set for us?